Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, like everyone else, I'll thank you for putting together these uh, seminars. They're great. Uh, and thanks to everybody for tuning in uh, today to hear what we have to say. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matthew Camisa, and I'm the project leader for the uh, Resource Assessment Project with MassDMF. We conduct a biannual trawl survey, and we also conduct an annual uh, Young of the Year Winter Flounder uh, SANE survey, beach SANE survey on the south shore of the Cape. Uh, today, I'll give you just an overview on the trawl surveys. So the history of the trawl survey uh, dates back to the 70s. And after conducting a pilot trawl survey in Nantucket Sound from 1974 through 77 on a small DMF research vessel, uh, Arnold Howe uh, pursued a coastwide survey. And the principal objective is to determine species composition and relative abundance of fish populations uh, in Massachusetts waters. Uh, Dan Arnold is a was a leading uh, a leader among uh, mass inshore fishermen. He was contracted by Arnie to conduct the first coastwide surveys. Uh, he fished out of Plymouth and he owned the fishing vessel Francis Elizabeth, which was a 170 horsepower, 55 foot wooden dragger. Uh, and he was instrumental in the first few years of the coastwide survey due to his extensive knowledge of Tolba Bottom in state waters. So the first four years were completed on the Francis Elizabeth or the first eight full surveys. And then in 1982, Arnie made the jump to the research vessel Gloria Michelle. The Gloria Michelle has a pretty colorful history. She was a shrimper in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, seized by the US Coast Guard for running drugs. When it was seized, they found I forget how many thousands of pounds of marijuana stuffed in the fish hold. Um, at that time, there was a young NOAA Corps officer by the name of Jack Moakley, who petitioned to have the vessel brought up to the Northeast and outfitted for ground fish trawling uh, to take care of some of the needs of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center right in Woods Hole and have a Sandy Hook. Um, and the right panel here is just the most recent uh, crew photo that we have. For those of you that don't know us, uh, front row left to right is Vin Manfredi and Mark Zemanski. They're both project members. And back row left to right is myself, then Lieutenant Chris Gallagher, uh, deckhand George Morton, who's a commercial lobsterman out of Maine, comes down to help us out every year, and Lieutenant Ben Van Dyne. So for the 2021 surveys, Lieutenant Ben Van Dyne is the officer in charge. Uh, we use a random stratified sampling design and we are stratified by depth. There are 103 randomly selected stations per survey, which gives us a coverage of roughly one per 19 square nautical miles. Uh, the May survey is time to capture adult uh, spring spawning fish. The September survey is time to capture the juvenile fish in their nursery habitats. These are daylight only toes. It's a 20 minute tow is the goal uh, at two and a half knots. And if all goes well, it works out to just over eight tenths of a nautical mile long. Our survey area covers all uh, Massachusetts territorial waters from the New Hampshire border down to the Rhode Island border. The area is split into five geographic regions. Uh, starting in the south, region one is Buzzards Bay, Vineyard Sound, and south of Martha's Vineyard. Region two was all of Nantucket Sound. Region three is south of Nantucket and then up the backside of the Cape, east of the Cape, all the way to P-Town. Uh, region four is Cape Cod Bay and region five finally is Mass Bay and Ipswich Bay to the north. So we have a total of 23 strata, which range in size from uh, 20 square nautical miles, which is strata 14, which is the deepest water at the mouth of Vineyard Sound and Buzzards Bay. Uh, all the way up to 210 square nautical miles, which is strata 16. That's the 31 to 60 in Nantucket Sound. It's a very large area. Uh, our total survey area is over 1,800 square nautical miles, and it includes both the Gulf of Maine and Southern New England stock areas. Basically, everybody knows Gulf of Maine is the region four and five, and Southern New England is one through three. And there is some overlap with the uh, NEFSC 
Northeast Fisheries Science Center bottom trawl survey. So our survey gear has remained unchanged since 1978. Our net is a North Atlantic type two seam otter trawl. It has a 39 foot head rope and a 51 foot foot rope, uh, relatively small compared to industry standards. Uh, the panels are constructed entirely of nylon, which is uh, proving to be harder and harder to get over the years. In fact, our last purchase, we, we over-purchased and created a stockpile uh, just because we're a little nervous that the manufacturer may not make it anymore. Uh, the sweep is made of three and a half inch rubber cookies on a three eighths trollex chain. We do use a one quarter inch knotless liner in our cod end, so we catch very small fish uh, all the way down to one centimeter squid. And our doors are wood and steel doors by Fred Tomkowitz. Uh, Tomkowitz doors were the in industry standard uh, in New Bedford back in the late 70s. I apologize, the picture is a little bit dark, but the two panels on the left show uh, our doors. It happens to be hanging from an engine hoist, which is how we move them. Um, there are five wooden planks uh, with steel framing. They measure 40 inches high by 72 inches long. They're double shoed and they weigh 325 pounds a piece. We maintain two pair of doors uh, in the very unlikely event that we lose a door, we wouldn't wanna be out of business. So we have a brand new uh, backup set ready to go. Mark's got them all rigged up with chains ready to go. God forbid we ever need them. Um, and the right uh, photo shows our uh, bundled trawl nets. So we maintain seven trawl nets and we carry five on the boat uh, at all times, one on the net drum and four in reserve uh, along the gunnels of the boat. Okay, so now we're finally on the boat and in the top left corner, you can see it's a beautiful day in Cape Cod Bay. The weather's always that calm on my survey and the net is being deployed. And if everything goes well, after 20 minutes of towing on the bottom, we'll haul back. Once the net is wound onto the net drum, the catch in the cod end is hoisted over the sorting table and the pucker strap is tripped to release the catch onto the table. We always take a look up inside the cod end and the liner to make sure that there's nothing left up there. And once the catch is on the table, we take a photograph of it and then the sorting process begins. So this is a great view of the back deck uh, while we are uh, working, uh, working up a catch. And basically it shows the doors hanging off the side of the boat in case you're not familiar with uh, draggers. Uh, the net is on the net reel right in the center uh, above the stern ramp where the net comes on and off the boat. Um, the sorting table is the white table and there's four people standing around it working on the catch. Uh, there's, you can't see them all, but there are baskets and buckets all over the, around everybody's legs there. And you can see the spare nets along the rails in the lower left and lower right hand corners. Uh, we always carry spares because when we tear up, we, we want to be able to get right back into business. And in this picture, uh, Vinny, the chief scientist, is at workstation one, and he's already started to enter uh, species and weights to get the tow going. So here's a few examples of sorting the catch. We sort the entire catch by species and sometimes uh, by sex. For instance, uh, cancer crabs, spiny dogfish, lobsters, all get sorted by sex. Um, the larger, more abundant species go into bushel baskets and the smaller, less abundant species are sorted into one gallon uh, buckets. So here, you know, there's some cod in the upper left, uh, I'm sorry, upper right, there's haddock in the upper left, a bunch of sublegal sea scallops and then some just assorted miscellaneous species in the white buckets. So here's some uh, typical toes. The top left is a typical light spring toe, and it has uh, looks like winter flounder, window pane, northern sea robin, and rock crabs. Uh, the top right photo is a 2,500 pound toe of haddock, uh, a spring haddock toe. The bottom left is a very typical fall toe uh, that contains um, thousands of juvenile scup, butterfish, and squid. We generally uh, make a mix of that. We won't pick that whole table and sort that all out. We'll make a mix, create a subsample, sort the subsample, and then expand that back out to the uh, weight of the, the total mix. And the bottom right it happens to be a large toe of uh, spiny dogfish. 
And sometimes uh, the catch is too large. Uh, we have problem toes. We can't get it on the boat, can't get it on the table. Uh, this is an example of a very large toe of sulfur sponge. We were able to get it up the stern ramp. It, it's that, that bag on the, the left photo is sitting on the deck and clearly the catch goes all the way up over the net drum. So we had to dump that on deck. There's no way we could hoist that up onto the table. And sometimes we get uh, so much in the net that we can't even get it on the boat. This happens to be a very large toe of spiny dogfish. Um, that catch is well up into the bellies. That's probably 20, 30,000 pounds of spiny dogfish. In a case like that, uh, we will fish for the tripping line uh, with the bag right with the net right behind the boat while it's still in the water. We have to trip that net just to release the catch, just to get the net back. Uh, we do our best to maintain some sample out of out of a dogfish toe like that to try to get an accurate uh, length frequency and sex split on what was in the net. And we, if we get that, we can use that for dogfish abund uh, abundance indices uh, and biomass indices, but not for any other species if it's a toe where we had to release so much catch. Okay, so now that we have all the fish sorted on the deck, how do we collect the data? Well, back in 78, we started with uh, waterproof paper logs on clipboards. And there'd be one guy sitting at the table uh, recording everything that everybody was shouting at him. And um, the, we used wire baskets. They were wire bushel baskets. We would clip a bridle to them and they'd hang them up on a salter scale from, some, from somewhere in the rigging on deck. And the, the small buckets would be hung on the little uh, sh brass chatillion scales there. In 1993, they made a big jump and bought a large Morel platform scale because it was much easier to throw baskets on and off a platform on the deck than it was to attach a bridle and hang them from a scale in the rigging. In 2006, we were able to get a small Morel platform scale as well to handle the small bucket weights, which greatly increased our accuracy and precision. And in 2010, we switched to full electronic data collection and started using FISCUS 1.6. FISCUS stands for Fishery Scientific Computing System. It's, uh, it was created by uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service and uh, it's used to collect data electronically at sea. So that enabled us to use touchscreen monitors, digital scales, electronic measuring boards, as well as uh, digital calipers and uh, barcode scanners. And in 2019, we upgraded to Fiscus 2.0. Uh, and the two benefits of that were uh, container tracking, which cuts down on errors. Uh, basically, every basket and bucket has a barcode label on it. And when the chief scientist enters a species and weight, he has to scan, he or she has to scan that container. And then the system keeps track of what's in that container. When it gets passed to the next station for length workup or aging growth sampling, the sampler has to scan that container and that confirms that it's the right species. Uh, the other uh, benefit is uh, greater enhanced control over our sampling protocols. We can basically program special requests and aging growth sampling right into Fiscus so that we get uh, reminders at sea when we enter a fish, whether or not we need it, if we need to sample it or save it for someone for a special sample. So now the chief scientists uh, will enter the species and weights at workstation one. And from there, the baskets and buckets are distributed to workstations two and three uh, for length sampling and for potential age and growth sampling. Uh, in this case, it happens to be Finney is the chief. Uh, even if he wasn't in the photo, you would know this was his toe because of the small aquarium set up on the back of the table there. We have water plumbed onto, uh, seawater plumbed onto all of our tables for uh, cleanup purposes, but guaranteed if it's Vinny's toe, there's a couple of buckets with some fish swimming around in them over there, and he does his best to keep them alive before they go back over, and, and we appreciate that. So uh, on the other side of the boat now, after Vinny's entered all the species and weights, um, we have Elise taking lengths on a basket of red hake. So the measuring board under her hand is a long sensor that's built right into the table, and the little white wand in her hand is a magnet. So she simply has to place the fish on the measuring board, touch the magnet to the end of the tail, and listen for the sound to confirm data entry. So with Fiscus, 
every time uh, a data element gets added and registered, there's an audible um, response. So when you come out with us, you have three workstations all entering uh, lengths and weights and sampling fish. So there's bells, whistles, dings, elephant noises, you name it, we've got them programmed in there. It's, uh, it can be quite comical throughout the day. Uh, and also in this slide, you can see Mark Russo is in the background. He's working at workstation two. That's the physically the largest table. So that's typically where we do all of our uh, age and growth sampling. And it looks like he is desperately looking for the second otolith on probably a 12 centimeter winter flounder. It's always uh, very elusive to find that second otolith on those small fish. And uh, how, do we, uh, how do we ensure that we have accurate data? We conduct individual station audits at sea to resolve issues while people are still uh, right there on the boat to remember. So basically, as soon as a tow wraps up and the last data elements are added, the chief scientist will go down below to the server and uh, conduct an audit right away. And if anything gets flagged, we run right back upstairs and we can ask, hey, what did you do with those whiting? or I'm missing a length on that one rock crab. Uh, and sometimes we'll find it still in a bucket on the scale, or they might be off to the side in a basket because we couldn't throw stuff over because we're already conducting the next tow. So it helps to do those audits right away uh, to resolve some of those issues while things are still fresh in people's minds. We also have an automatic uh, daily data backup procedure that runs so we don't lose any data in case one of the four computers were to crash. And we maintain uh, field notebooks um, on the bridge, down in the fish hold at the server, and at the workstations just to write down uh, anything out of the ordinary that may have happened or anything that might be a question uh, down the line in the audit process. Uh, once we're back on shore, the data are loaded into the NEFSC uh, survey database, and we conduct an extensive three to four week audit usually. Uh, using a program that searches for various length weight issues or uh, minimum, maximum length outliers, uh, that sort of thing. And we really take our time and comb through it uh, piece by piece and make sure that we can resolve any, any outstanding issues. Once those have all been corrected, uh, it's loaded to master data and then it's available uh, to anybody that has access to the uh, SVDBS tables uh, down at Woods Hole. So our data is used many different ways. Uh, most of our requests involve uh, indices of relative biomass and abundance. That's what everybody wants to know. Um, we can also provide data on sex and maturity of sampled fish, as well as uh, aged indices or uh, species distribution, say. And we contribute to the assessment of numerous regional uh, fin fish stocks, as well as a few uh, invertebrates. And we routinely fill data requests for anybody that makes a request. Our data is available as soon as we finish the audit and is loaded to master data. Um, yeah, there, there's no restrictions whatsoever. If somebody places a request to us uh, through email, you could literally have a copy of the entire database uh, in its rawest form. Uh, we are also a really good source for uh, special samples for people doing uh, research. Uh, so we'll collect live, fresh, or frozen samples during any survey. Uh, we get uh, loads of requests for that, whether it be a cooler full of live uh, knobbed whelk for uh, Steve, Korea, uh, Steve Wilcox is dying to crack open some more whelks, or if somebody uh, just needs uh, um, genetic samples or whatnot, we can accommodate that relatively easily. And oftentimes when people reach out to us for data, uh, they're not quite sure what we have, and sometimes they're not quite sure what they're looking for. So we'll work with them to fine tune the request uh, based on that information. One of the things we do as soon as the data is available is we generate a whole suite of species reports uh, for important species and uh, um, stock area combinations that are common requests. Not only do we want to see them, but we already know people are waiting for the data. And so we'll just make them up right away anyways. Um, these reports uh, generally include the stratified mean biomass and abundance per tow. So in this example, the left panel, you can see it's Gulf of Maine cod. Um, unfortunately, they've been in steady decline uh, in biomass since the early 2000s. And the right panel um, is the abundance plot for the same cod. Uh, and it shows a few a little bit of uh, increasing in, in the recent years, including uh, 
2019. Let's see. So the next thing we might look at would be a percent occurrence plot. This is the uh, COD percent occurrence plot here. Uh, there was a large decline um, in the number of toes containing COD in the Gulf of Maine starting in 2010, but they're showing some signs of recovery in recent years. And you know, I suspect that has a lot to do with uh, young of the year COD. So then we plot the young of the year COD, which are critters less than nine centimeters. And we see that the abundance index was uh, are obviously largely driven by the small fish. You can see that in 2019. Another thing we'll look at is length frequency plots. And uh, for this example, we can look at the two size bins separately for the cod. The left panel is the uh, Gulf of Maine cod greater than eight centimeters. And you can see there's a, a pretty steady decline over the last uh, decade. And the right panel just happens to show those young of the year uh, Gulf of Maine cod or age zeros. And uh, there's a few good years. Uh, of abundance since 2003. Uh, we basically just get the signal on those. Another thing that we produce would be um, these uh, graduated uh, GIS plots. Oftentimes researchers wanna know where we encounter certain species or certain maturity stages. Uh, so the left panel is uh, region one through five cod abundance. And again, that, that plot's largely driven by young of the year cod. You can see all of the hits we have down south in Buzzards Bay and Nantucket Sound. Uh, that's largely a scattering of uh, young of the year cod at, at many stations. And the right panel is a recent request that uh, Mark put together for Derek for uh, fall Jonah crab abundance, uh, showing that we catch them in uh, the Gulf of Maine. So it's all of Cape Cod Bay, Mass Bay North, a little bit down the backside, and then a small showing in the deep waters uh, at the mouth of Vineyard Sound. Now, you may have noticed that um, in, in many of these plots, in all of these plots, there's no 2020 data. And the reason for that is because we didn't sail in 2020 uh, due to COVID-19 concerns. So this was our survey season. Here we are tied to the dock for the entire year. And uh, this was the first time that we've missed a survey since its inception in 1978. It was a very difficult decision to make. We did create a plan to minimize the health and safety risks. We had all of our stations selected. All of the equipment was ready to sail. Uh, but ultimately, we felt that the risks were too great. And the decision was made by DMF to cancel each survey a few weeks before we were scheduled to begin. And I completely agreed with both of those decisions. And we were not the only ones affected. Um, I had a recent uh, NEAMAP meeting, Northeast Area Monitoring Assessment Program meeting, where we went through a list of who was impacted. Um, the center only got off their first leg last year. That's right, right when COVID uh, started acting up. Uh, so they canceled everything else for the rest of the year. Maine, New Hampshire missed the spring, but got three quarters of the fall. Uh, Rhode Island did complete their survey, but it's a little different. It's very small scale, only a few fixed stations. Um, only day trips, and it's a it's a captain and mate. Uh, so I think it's it's easier to accomplish that when you don't have the overnight issue of uh, spending nights on a boat. Uh, New York got their winter survey in before everything fell apart. Spring was canceled, and they only got half of their delayed summer survey. Jersey is canceled and will remain canceled until mass vaccinations are available. Uh, Maryland got their skiff trawl survey completed again, probably two two biologists in a boat day tripping, a uh, little bit easier to handle. VIMS had to cancel spring, uh, but they did get their fall survey. And of course, the, the CMAP group had several canceled surveys as well as other impacted surveys. So to get to Bob's point before we started, how do we plan on accomplishing our surveys uh, in 2021? So we worked closely with the NOAA Corps officers uh, to establish a seven-page COVID-19 mitigation plan that minimizes risks to vessel crew and scientists. And here are some of the highlights <laughs> of that plan. So basically, we had to reduce our staffing. Uh, they had to reduce their crew. We had to reduce our, our scientists. Um, I typically sail with 
uh, five people every day, sometimes six if it's day trips and and the, and it's going to be a very uh, we're down to a minimum of three at most four uh, per day. And we have a very altered schedule. For those of you that know the survey, I generally can offer you day trips, two day, three day, and maybe even a four day trip uh, if you're interested. It's an 18 day survey, and there's a whole mix of, uh, of number, length of trips in there. Now we're gonna do three six day legs out of Woods Hole with one day off in between. So every leg will leave from Woods Hole on a Wednesday and get back late on a Monday night. And then the boat stays at the dock Tuesday to disinfect and resupply. Um, so that means uh, Mark, Vin and I will be doing two, two of the three legs each. And I've been looking for two additional volunteers for each leg for a total of only six for the entire survey. We generally have, I don't know, 15, 20 something volunteers every survey. So this is quite a bit different. Um, Anybody who gets on the boat has to uh, do a seven day shelter in place and produce two negative COVID tests. Uh, while we're on the boat, there's gonna be daily self temperature and health checks. Um, we're definitely gonna have to minimize the amount of time we spend in the galley and uh, you know the food, because that's what always seems to happen. Um, there's still going to be masking requirements as well as gloves and uh, social distancing. And while we're tied up in port, uh, where our public access will be uh, limited, which means we won't be going out and hitting the watering holes and the restaurants. The vessel's going to try to cook probably at least half of the dinners. And on the other nights, maybe we, we get takeout or something delivered right to the bulkhead. So we'll be able to get off, stretch our legs on the dock. And uh, that's, I think, the best we can do once we create that bubble and everybody gets on the boat for the six days. We don't want to then break that bubble by having people uh, going out on, on for a night on the town. So um, we have all of our stations selected. Fiscus 2 is up and running and tested. All we need to do now is load the vessel and toss the dock lines on May 5th. Now, next week, we are going to conduct some uh, test tows because the vessel has not been used now in a year and a half. Um, the captain is anxious to go out for three days. He budgeted three days to, uh, on them. Uh, we, we're going to tag along and we're going to bring a, the doors, a net, our, our cables. And he's going to train uh, some other people on the boat and just go through the motion, probably in Vineyard Sound, um, and make sure that the vessel's working right, all of the systems are working. We don't have any hydraulic leaks. I think that's a very smart idea uh, because the worst thing you can do with a boat is let things sit for too long. So we're looking forward to next week getting out and uh, making some some testos. And no trawl survey presentation would be complete without acknowledging our funding. So a big shout out to uh, Kevin and Steph uh, for keeping us funded uh, through the US Fish and Wildlife Service Sport Fish Restoration Program. Uh, basically DMF spends the money and we are reimbursed for up to 75% of the expenses of the uh, survey. And as always, thanks to our volunteers, um, we hope to return to a more normal survey schedule in the fall. Uh, we can't wait to sail with you all again. And when we do, the Klondike bars will be on me. <laughs>